Hello, I'm Jeffrey Fox here, and we're starting this next lecture set, which is on MapReduce in general, and Hadoop in particular. And we're going to start off in this uh, first few slides on the introduction to the overall lecture and on to how it, uh, MapReduce and Hadoop fit into a cosmic uh, view of big data software systems. MapReduce is Somehow a symbol of big data, and as it was the first major technology introduced, and it was incredibly successful, given that it didn't really exist as a concept before 2004, when it was introduced by uh, Jeffrey Dean and collaborators at Google. And it's staggering how such a simple idea had escaped people's notice. Actually, people used MapReduce before, they didn't call it by that name, but most importantly, they didn't realize the importance of implementing an optimal version of that particular technology, which is simpler than many of the things people do, certainly in parallel computing. All right, so here we are. This is part A. Let's go. Okay, what's in this uh, slide set? First, we discuss some overall big data issues, trying to position Hadoop in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem for big data, um, and give some examples of how, they, how it fits together with other tools. Then we have an overview of MapReduce itself. Then we go into some detail on Hadoop and its different components. Uh, we give an example of PageRank as, a, as its use. And then there's another slide set on Apache Spark, which is a sort of sophisticated Hadoop. Apache Storm, which is key for streaming, and other big data programming environments such as Twister 2, which we produced at IU. So that's it. Thank you. All right, here we are. This is a slide deck uh, which summarizes 350 software systems. And they're arranged in 21 layers. Each of those layers corresponds to a particular functionality important in big data systems. And Hadoop fits into this very important category, 14A, which is basic programming model and runtime. And it's highlights MapReduce up here. And Hadoop is the first entry, and Spark is the second entry. And uh, 14, level 14, I eventually, I originally only have one layer of that around those concepts, but then I split it into um, what you might call batch processing or repository processing or stream processing. And stream processing does similar things to, to, to um, batch processing, but does it for data buzzing in and a real-time stream, such as Twitter, uh, Twitter tweets or um, e-commerce um, clicks and so on. And the amazing thing is there are, even in 2016 January, there are 350. There's probably 500 at least now, because I decided that I'd made the point, and I shouldn't, up, I didn't even have room really to up, up, update it. And we didn't gain anything, because we were just adding more examples. And I didn't find any new layers for some time. This is a part of a concept called HBC ABDS. The high performance computing enhanced Apache big data system, which is our view of how these uh, software systems will be architected. All right. Uh, notice above this level are things like Hive, which we will come to, which is SQL on top of Hadoop. Hadoop was originally designed to do database operations in a way that made the parallelism much easier than for traditional database engines. Okay, here we have a slightly pretty slide from, got from the previous one, where we decorate the list of um, 350 software packages by their cosmic meaning. And rather than 21, as the original decomposition was, we only have eight here. One is security, that's the cross-cutting. There are other cross-cutting. The other is the user. User interface control, we tend to use Python for that these days. That's what this class will use. Then there are a whole set of libraries like um, TensorFlow, Mahout, and uh, um, SkyKit Learn and things. And that, those run machine learning real fast. Well, 
if not real fast, real easily. Then we have to orchestrate them all. Take, uh, we have the interface, then we have these little jobs, lots of machine learning, some data engineering to clean it up and so on. Then, that, then we have the overall masterminding of the data management and staging. That's Hadoop and Spark and Twister 2 and for streaming Storm. Then we have to communicate between these components because we've broken it up into lots of different parts and those parts must talk to each other. That requires messages. Just as I'm sending you a message with my voice, those voice waves go roaring into the computer, get recorded, and then they roar out again as new messages. Um, then we have to schedule and manage the tasks. That's where Kubernetes is used, or uh, Mesos, or Yarn, and things like that. And finally, we have to set up the infrastructure. That's where OpenStack, Cloud Mesh, and things like that. Uh, in this class, we use Cloud Mesh. So, all right, let's have a slightly more even realistic view in the next slide. Okay, the next slide says, well, things aren't quite as clean. Everything has a bit of security in it. Uh, machine learning running fast requires cooperation of lots of parts. The user interface permeates in everywhere, as does orchestration and staging and communicating and scheduling and setting up the infrastructure. So this is the same slide as before with the nice, elegant, separated ovals mashed up together. So that's the real world, and because we have all this mashing up, it's not actually quite clear what anything does, and it makes for a very confusing uh, situation where some people can make a lot of money by understanding the confusion. All right, the last uh, next two slides, the last to the next two slides, are on the global AI modeling um, uh, supercomputer, GAIMSC, which is what um, Hadoop and uh, Spark and Storm and Twister 2 are trying to implement. So we um, sort of re reverse engineered Spark and Hadoop and Storm and found out the components we need to make this work. And these components are listed on these slides. We have to have points in the programming where we decide what to do. Take stock, those are called data flow nodes. They're for state and configuration management. Messages emerge and Emerge from data flow nodes and get absorbed into other data flow nodes. You save it's that a data flow node is where you can change things because otherwise it's just rushing on um, without uh, too much thought. Then we have to actually decide how to do the execution. We have to map. Um, we have bolts in Storm and maps in uh, uh, Hadoop. And we have to put them into containers and processes and threads and cores and nodes and accelerators and so on. And there are many ways of doing that. Then we have to do parallel computing, which means we have to take these different parts, we've um, chopped the job up and orchestrate them so they actually solve the same job. Um, we don't want the Tara Babel with everybody speaking a different language and not understanding each other. There are things like the owner computes rule, which says that if you have a piece of data, that data lives somewhere, and the place where it lives is in charge of computing for that data. That's just a way of organizing things to avoid too much data movement, because data movement is very expensive. We have job submission, and there are various job submission systems, such as Yarn and Mesos. Those are similar to job management systems. Task migration. Well, if a node goes down or else we need to get more nodes, which is elasticity, we have to somehow do things. As OpenWhisk is a, is a serverless computing technology which has elastic technology inside it, which you can use. Streaming and function as a service, that were OpenWhisk, Heron, Storm, Kafka, and RabbitMQ come in. Task execution with queues and threads and things like that. Task scheduling, you have to decide when each task runs. You typically, when you have tasks in a data flow node, they only run when the data that they need has arrived. Finally, in this page, we have a task graph, because we have A is done, A gives a message, B is done, but B receives a message from C over here, and B sends messages to D and E and F and G and so on. That's the graph. The graph is either static or dynamic or both. And you need to parse that graph and properly map it onto the resources you have. And then the last set of sort of 
components of the cosmic operating system of the distributed operating system of the world. We have three types of communication, messages, as in uh, Storm and Heron. These are publish, subscribe, heavyweight messaging. We have the data flow communication, which is uh, fine grain, but still not as fast as a BSP, which is the third set, which is for parallel computing. Very well determined source and target, and the source and the, the processes don't change, but you just send messages between them. And uh, we have work, we know how, we, we are an expert on all these areas and build systems and basic technology in each case. Then we have to actually store the data somewhere. That's where um, HDFS, NoSQL, SQL, and so on comes in. We have to actually also allow the data to come from the edge. Your teddy bear, smart teddy bear, sends a message to you, and that message goes via the cloud. And that has to that has to have be stored somewhere in a probably a NoSQL database for teddy bears, um, and so on. And we need to manage that. And then we have um, the data is distributed, and you need to understand how properly to save the data, access the data, not do access unless you need it. That's um, relaxed and things. And Spark has a wonderful technology called RDD there. Heron has something called Streamlets. A Twister 2 has something called T-sets. These are little basic core databases capturing structures in the program. <coughs> Fault tolerance. The reason why Hadoop and Spark are super uh, popular is they were proper, correctly and brilliantly designed to be fault tolerant. That gives people in charge of everything a warm feeling, even if it's not important because the system doesn't crash. Or if it does crash, you do something called press a button and rerun. It is a somewhat different for streaming of batch jobs. And it's, a, it's also connected to these coordination points because they're a place where you can actually do backups. And Spark and Flink and MPI and Heron all have different models. Finally, we have security, where uh, more research is needed. And um, that crosses all components. All right. So when we look at uh, MapReduce, this is not a Duke MapReduce, we notice it has a very um, nice parallelism method, which people uh, find very exciting because it's simplicity. We know this is simplicity comes because it's only doing simple problems. Uh, if we look back at some of the older days of parallel computing, we could actually do lots of wonderful interfaces for parallel computing for solving differential equations. But then after about five years, uh, the sophisticated uh, solvers of such equations got to such complex ideas that these simple methods did not work. We will have to see if big data suffers that problem. It might do, at least for some applications, because the Reason why Spark and Hadoop are so easy to use is, part, use is partly because they only solve one problem. All right, so anyway, a critical feature of, of um, Hadoop and Spark and things is they're looking at distributed computing. Now, if you look at parallel computing and distributed computing, they're roughly the same thing. Although in parallel computing, we assume everything is very close together, so we get very fast communication. In distributed computing, we assume things can be far apart, although we can still expect to get better performance if things are closer to each other. Fault tolerance is pretty important because these big data systems are pretty, pretty messy. They're in implemented in a way that allows faults to enter the system. And we need to find a very easy automatic approach to fault tolerance. Um, driving the big data system is Data, that data lives in files. Notice this is the batch system with or repository system where it is files. For the um, real time systems, those uh, data will be streaming in from the outside world. And there are several interesting programming models or programming interfaces attached to MapReduce. All right. <clears throat> so if we look at big data. Originally, when I used to do um, work in this field, uh, maybe in the 80s, I was told that what was important was processing 
ATM, ATM transactions. That's what was the dominant business application. And people solved large scale computers to companies to do that type of work. A transaction processing where each of the transactions was incredibly high value. You're never allowed to make a mistake in the bank processing. But now, now when we come to the big data revolution, we have a much broader range of applications, Facebook, YouTube, Gmail, Amazon, Snapchat, dot, 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 and Instagram. And that's a broader range, or LinkedIn, and that's a broader range of applications. Um, especially if we're now going to look at, you know, applying it to healthcare, so we're going to be running genomic analysis and things like that. So a much broader range of applications, and we needed more sophisticated technology. And also the emphasis on robustness was not quite as important. When you do a search, you don't really notice that the search only went over 99.3% of the world's data rather than 99.99%. And so a certain amount of faults in reading, in this case, reading the uh, search engine, so the stored search data is allowed. Um, even in a tweet, well, maybe there's some very important people whose tweets are sacred. But in general, if there's a small mistake in a tweet or a tweet gets delayed a little, that is not a disaster. Whereas if you made a mistake in a bank account, or, or that would be a catastrophe, and people assume that mistakes are never made. So a huge emphasis were in uh, uh, earlier data processing system was never making faults. In MapReduce and more generally cloud computing, you need to control faults and be uh, smoothly uh, oblivious to them and address them. Uh, <coughs> so. We then went to, there was a lot of research, actually most of it was in industry. Places like Google produced most of the pioneer uh, results because they had actually all the data. It's not so easy to do this uh, stage of, actually even now it's not so easy to do uh, research in this area. Because we don't have the data that these uh, large companies do. <coughs> so Matt produces one of the most amazing ideas. Such a simple idea. It was known to all sorts of people, including me, for many, many years. But we never realized that it was the critical technology for processing lots and lots of big data. And this contribution of Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Kimawat came along in 2004. It's cited on February 19th of 2019, 26,130 times. It's obviously gone up. It just changed things. It was presented at the conference, but it's up on lots and lots of CS departments because everybody uses it in their classes. It is so amazing that such a simple idea uh, was so important. And possibly it got oversold because people did things with MapReduce that shouldn't have been, but it was really important. It cannot be overestimated how fundamental the revolutionary MapReduce was. And it is still, as I mentioned, probably the dominant approach to big data processing, even though it is not what will do deep learning and things like that. It will do basic things like databases, where the operations can be thought of as an update, which in this they call a map, which is like changing your credit card account. Followed by a reduction, which is to chain, add up the results of all the different parallel processes. Let's go on and tr see how MapReduce is implemented in Hadoop. Thank you. So here we have it, uh, illustrated here by Sam, who is trying to um, have some uh, juice made from the apple, and so. This, uh, this is a sequential Sam. He is just making uh, one juice from one apple. And here is the equivalent of the map process, which is cutting the apple, putting it in the blender, and making the juice. That's, this all here is the uh, map. And here, where there is no reduce, because you just, while well, the reduction is just pouring all the results into the, into the glass. All right.
Now we want to, you know, if we have lots of SAMs and lots of juice, and the juice needs to be configured in different ways, we have a more sophisticated uh, uh, problem and we have to be more creative. And notice that we have, uh, we introduce our key value pairs, which are critical in MapReduce because it's the data structure it supports. A key is the A for apple, or O for orange, or B for pineapple. And every real apple, or real orange, or real pineapple is associated with a key. And the value of the key is the actual physical um, fruit. Uh, then we go through a map stage, which is cutting the fruit up. Yum, yum, yum. Here we are. Lots of mappers. The mappers are knives. And those mappers are all diligently work in parallel. Notice each knife works in parallel. And they produce a whole set of output key value pairs. Well, they're still key value pairs, but the actual value, the keys are the same. Or, or they're really actually apple slices and orange slices and pineapple slices. And they're related, but not quite the same, maybe. And the values are certainly different because they're all sliced up. Then what do we do? We then do a reduction operation which um, sorts the um, apples, pineapples, and oranges into groups which you want to make particular juice. Here we have the apple orange juice, the orange pineapple juice, and the pineapple apple juice. And those go into separate blenders. This is the reduction operation. And they finally get stored in the bottle and sold at the, uh, well, maybe it's now sold online. Uh, previously, it had been sold at a store. All right, here we are. That's the answer. This is map produce for drinking for eating fruit. So you map a list of key value pairs into another list of key value pairs. You group them by the key and you reduce them to a list of values. This is the key concept in map produce. All right, so after that example, we get on to some more formal and Probably less exciting discussion. So it's a programming model, or a runtime model. It's both programming and runtime model. It's uh, involved with huge data sets, because when we apply, because this, uh, this effectively describes every single database operation. It's a particular case of MapReduce. And um, terabytes, of course, is a um, pretty small amount of data these days. It's going to be. Um, petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, and so on. But um, actually today in science, hundreds of terabytes is a large number for operational use. And the largest experiment, which is the Large Hadron Collider at uh, CERN, which is looking for Higgs bosons and related fundamental particles, it has now around 100 petabytes of data. Um, so. Okay, and now we need to process this. And that processing, as I mentioned, is typically done in a distributive fashion. When Google processes its searches, it is not doing all of its processing in one place. It's doing it in a coordinated fashion across the world. And indeed, the people processing the Higgs boson data from CERN are also processing it on, on around the world. Although they would not call it a cloud, they would call it a grid. Although it is essentially a, a sort of early version. What's a grid is, an, for this purpose, is an early version of a crowd. Um, each instance of MapReduce, MapReduce has lots of instances. Each one will probably run on an individual cluster. And so actually, in some sense, it's parallel computing. MapReduce does itself not imply terribly close coupling between components. And so effectively, it looks more like a distributed computing paradigm. Because the key difference between parallel and distributed computing is that for parallel computing, you want microsecond latency in the synchronization between uh, different parts. Whereas for distributed computing, it, it can be um, certainly milliseconds, and often when it's across the country, hundreds of milliseconds. So. Naturally, MapReduce has maps and reductions. I already illustrated that for fruit. Mapping is cutting it up. Reduction is joining the different cutters 
joining all the arches together and so on. So here are some pictures coming from the NIST working group on big data. And um, here's an example where um, you might take data coming in. That data is stored on a disk. This disk has an interface, which is either a file system where the Hadoop file system, HDFS, is the one you'd most look at for this these lecture notes. And HDFS is hugely popular as the backend for everything. HBase is a so-called NoSQL database, which is a slightly more advanced uh, interface to HDFS, also coming originally from uh, uh, um, Google. And then on top of this, we will run these various technologies, all in that wonderful set of 350 I showed. And the one we're looking at here is Hadoop, and we'll later look at Spark. Giraffe is a, and pig, pig is a way of running lots of Hadoop jobs together. Giraffe is particularly aimed, comes from Facebook, and is aimed at processing the um, um, graphs that Facebook gets from connections of people. On top of this programming model, say Hadoop, we will run a library with functionality such as Mahout or R. Well, we, and or we will use a database, and Hive is the engine which you put on top of Hadoop to give it, to, to be able to make SQL queries at it. And that's good because many people know how to make SQL queries. And Hive is controlled by each catalog, the metadata catalog. So that's one example. Another example here is um, slightly uh, more sophisticated case. Where, by the way, five, and four, and ten are just there are ten separate big data scenarios identified by NIST. I just chose uh, two here. In other slides, I do some of the other ones, and um, this again has HDFS and HBase. It again has a dupe through pig, but on top of this, it has multiple engines. Um, they could be clustering. Um, could, you know, the last one could be visualization, the first could be clustering, the second could be uh, cleaning up the cluster, putting in a user interface to, to improve it or analyze it. And then you have to link all these things together, which are currently rather simple as a pipeline. And that is called orchestration or workflow, which is this layer here. And our cheerful uh, user is invoking the pipeline and examining the final results, the visualization. Hadoop is effectively used within each of these stages. Spark can actually do the overall orchestration. Here we illustrate a sort of interesting concept of horizontal and vertical scaling in the context of MapReduce. This is, comes from, a, when we're doing big data, so things are big. So how do we deal with bigness? And vertical and horizontal scaling are two ways of dealing with bigness. Vertically means that you take your little um, computer and just make it more powerful, like this. You add to that computer, give it more memory, more cores in its CPU, and so on. And then a bigger disk. And then you will find that the cheap databases don't work on those systems this big. And you have to go to Oracle and pay an arm and a leg and two or three noses to get an appropriate database. And that's one of the reasons Oracle is so successful. It has a lock on the higher end systems. Actually, uh, there's also, of course, IBM and Microsoft in that deal. But they all make a lot of money. The alternative, which was um, actually Hadoop uh, was a major player in implementing, is horizontal scaling. You take your tiny little computer, and then you have another one, another one, another one, another one. That is going to be linear in the number of costs and the number of computers you add. And you can run the same commodity database on all of them. And all you have to do is add up the results of all these databases. And that is precisely what MapReduce does. Because you can take a table, which is what the database sort of is, like in an express spreadsheet, spreadsheet. And then you take that table and either put all the columns. You take the columns and put some number of columns in each of processor or some number of rows in each processor or actually a bit of part of a, a sort of square subblock or sort of rectangular subblock of rows and columns. That's the most sophisticated 
and most efficient way of decomposing these problems. Anyway, this is classic parallel computing 101. How do you do parallel databases? And that's actually been known for them lots and lots of time. In fact, one of my colleagues when I was at Caltech, uh, he actually worked on that for, um, oh, I forget the company's name now. So this is cheaper because you, the, the software is open source. Um, you just have to uh, pay people like Cloudera, which just actually took over another possible player, a member action of actual player Hortonworks, whose business model is to actually get the software to work. So we have these two models. One is the Oracle model. They own everything, and they charge the arms and the legs. Alternatively, you have the open source model where the software sort of lives freely, and then you have lots of little companies who take that software and they sell their services to make it run properly. Um, and this gives you a situation, and this it turns out to be much cheaper. And there's large factors between the cost of horizontal scaling and the cost of vertical scaling. Okay, thank you.